welcome. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. It's about time. This is another one of the SLAM seminars, and uh, we're happy to be going into a series of, the, of, of more local people. We have a lot of projects going on on campus, and that's a big part of what we wanted to bring out here in the series. So today we're going to get to hear from Steve Desjardins and his group in the, in the School of Education, and they're going to tell us about some methods for making these measurements, doing experiments in place without needing to admit one class of students and then the next year admit a completely different class of students just to see what would happen. <laughs> right? yeah. Not usually very practical to do that. I also wanted to mention that we're sitting in the middle of a just about to open art exhibit by Randy Garber that is part of the Haystack Conference that's going to be taking place and there'll be an opening here on Friday from 6 to 8. So if you want to come to a party on Friday night, hmm. just come here. The room will be open and you can, you can join right in. Okay. Thanks a lot, Tim. Can you hear me okay back there? Okay. So uh, as you can see, there's an entourage of here from the School of Education today. And, uh, and Tim and I had some conversations over the last year about evaluation at the university in terms of the kinds of things that we think about in education, about evaluating educational interventions and practices. And, and so we decided uh, that we would demonstrate some of the uh, techniques that are out there to try to uh, help us try to make rigorous statements about program effects. So that's the basic objective here uh, today. Uh, part of it is also to provide an opportunity for our students who are here to do a presentation here in front of an audience and get some experience doing that. And they've been doing a lot of work on these kinds of things, so uh, that, that's uh, a, another one of the objectives. So. Uh, in terms of the importance of the rigor of educational research, uh, we, what we want to try to do, I guess, as educators is systematically improve education in terms of the policies and practices and, and um, procedures and programs and try to understand what works. That's the basic idea here. And in terms of uh, rigor of evidence, what we'd like to do is, is uh, be able to make causal statements about program effects. But that's often very difficult, as we'll, we'll show. Um, without doing so, uh, it's, as uh, Barbara Schneider from up the road in East Lansing says in an important report that was written for American Educational Research Association a few years ago, she notes that doing so is, it, without doing so, it's difficult to accumulate a knowledge base that has value for either practice or a future study. And, uh, but, and in that same report, what they note is that education research in general has lacked both rigor and relevance. And here's a quote from that report in which they say, their questions of causality have been at the forefront of educational debates and discussions in part because of the dissatisfaction with the quality of education research. And a common concern in this, in this paper and in general revolves around the design of and methods used in education research, which many claim have resulted in fragmented and often unreliable findings. So this is a bit of a slam on the education research. And uh, what we are trying to do here in terms of what we're teaching and what, uh, what we're trying to implement in terms of applications is to remedy some of this problem. Um, so, what about the term? I'm going to do a setup here about the, co the framework by which we discuss uh, co trying to make causal inferences. And each of the students will do a presentation of an application of a different technique designed to uh, get us to that goal. Now, the gold standard really is in terms of making causal inferences are randomized controlled trials. And there are pros and cons to these, as you can see up here. And, and the pros are, you know, you uh, can reduce or, or try to eliminate bias and spurious findings, thereby improving what we know about what works. The cons are they're very difficult sometimes to implement for ethical reasons, for all kinds of reasons, cost. And there may be inherent uh, errors in these things if you don't do them right. Uh, measurement problems, spillover effects, attrition of people from samples. Um, and, uh, but we think there are actually possibilities uh, to do such things here on campus. Even, for example, many times the living learning communities and, and programs like Europe or whatever are oversubscribed 
And so people, okay, it's like first come, first serve, right? Okay, why not randomize into these things? In which case you have a randomized design. So there are some possibilities if you get uh, creative about the way you do that. But what we want to really focus on is the fact that many times we are stuck with observational data and we can't or we don't have the luxury of having randomization working for us to our advantage. These are known, these methods that are, are, are used then are known as quasi-experimental methods or quasi-experimental designs and that's what we're going to focus on today. Many of them are variations of the famous kind of pre-test, post-test structures without randomization that you can read about that have been around for a long, long time. Um, the pros of these things are when they're done properly, they may actually be more generalizable than randomized trials because many times randomized trials are very small and oriented towards a very specific group. And a lot of times you can do quasi-experimental methods on very large groups and the results then are more generalizable. The cons are typically internal validity. How do you know whether the treatment, so to speak, really worked? because many times there are factors that are outside of the control that when randomization works in, like unobserved things we don't, we don't see on folks that are driving the results. So a common causal kind of scenario is this. We're interested in some cause which has, a, you know, a, a, for example, a treatment and there being some kind of an effect. But many times what happens is there's confounders, confounding relationships whether they be observable things, which we can then control for uh, in, uh, in statistical ways, or unobserved things like people's motivation, which we often don't have measurements for, and that's hard to tease out. What we'd like to know is we'd like to tease out that possible relationship here between these, these confounders and the cause uh, and the effect. And to do so uh, is kind of tricky. This is difficult because often um, there's non-random assignment into what we might call treatments. For example, students often self-select into many different kinds of treatments. They, they select into courses, into interventions, into programs, and this may result uh, in biased estimates when we use standard regression methods um, and to determine treatment effects. Uh, this typical program evaluation model is like number one up here where we have some outcome, for instance, what's the GPA of a student as a function of some of their individual characteristics and the treatment might be they live in a dorm or not. This is a famous example that people always use. Okay, if you live in the dorm, this is a one. If you don't, it's a zero. And the f you're interested in the effect of that, uh, ver uh, that re uh, parameter right there on the GPA. And a lot of times what the problem is, is that there's really a structural relationship under underlying this in which people aren't randomly assigned into treatments, they're self-selecting. And the treatment then is a function of some of the same things that are in this equation uh, and maybe some other things like motivation or whatever, unobserved, uh, unobserved things. And failure to account for this structure is a, is, a, is a big problem and often leads to biased estimates of that coefficient up there when all you do is equation one. And this is very kind of standard in, in education research. This is what we call the naive statistical model. And I bring this up because later you'll see we do some comparisons against the naive model. So what's the goal here with quasi-experimental methods? It really is to mimic the desirable properties of randomized controlled trials, and the solution then is to employ some methods that account for this non-random assignment problem. And that's what we're gonna demonstrate today. Now, there's a framework underlying all this, it's called the counterfactual framework. And this is owing to Don Rubin and Paul Holland and some others. There's lots of references in this, in this presentation. We'll put this up. Uh, Steve will put it up on the, um, on the uh, website and you'll be able to go read a lot of stuff about this. So um, a, de a simple definition of counterfactual framework though is what would have happened to the treated cases absent the treatment? Um, but the problem with that is we only observe people in one state. They're either treated or they're not. We don't see them in both states or more often than not. So what we need to do is try to establish this counterfactual or control group that would be a lot like the treated group. And therefore you can make some more rigorous claims about the uh, effect of treatment. 
Um, so that's kind of the, the conceptual framework. Now, in terms of the applications that, the, that we're going to present here today, there's going to be three of them. The first one is going to be about whether or not you start at a community college and, and then end up in a four-year, compared to people who start in a four-year, do people who start in a community college do any differently in four years than the people who were native, kind of? Uh, there's a selection problem here. And this is going to be demonstrated through the use of propensity score matching. The second one is, does high school course selection affect subsequent educational outcomes? Well, people choose their high school courses. They're not randomly assigned into different courses. And so we're going to show how you might tease that out using a technique called instrumental variables. The, th the third one is something that my colleague and Brian McCall and I have worked on for a number of years for Gates Foundation, which is the Gates Millennium Scholars Program, in which um, individuals are provided the scholarship, but there's a mechanism by which they get them. And we tease out the selection problem by use of something called regression discontinuity design. Um, in each of these methods, we're trying to adjust for this non-random assignment problem, thereby pr providing more rigorous statements uh, relative to that naive statistical model about the program effects. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over now to Alfredo, who will walk us through this Pensy score match. Uh, good evening, thanks everyone for being here. My name is Alfredo Sosa, I am, can you hear? Uh, okay, can I use this one? Hello? Hello, okay. My name is uh, Alfredo Sosa, I am third year doctoral student at the Center of the Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Education. And I will speak a little bit about one method used in educational research, which is called uh, matching. Uh, I will briefly comment on some, some of the features that did this method involves, uh, along with a particular application. And uh, specifically, this paper tries to answer the question of whether attendance to uh, two-year institution uh, results in differences in educational outcomes when compared with students attending four-year institutions. So, so the, the basic setup of this uh, paper is the recognition that students start from in different places. For instance, there are some students starting at two-year colleges and students starting at four-year colleges. If we just try to measure the difference in educational outcomes, such as retention rates or graduation rates ac 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 across these two groups, we're going to overstate the influence of this of attending two-year programs. Even if we do uh, a, a, a statistical naive me, uh, model that was described by Steve, uh, we also are gonna uh, try to uh, control for observed characteristics, but we're gonna end up with bias estimates as well, because of the reason that I already mentioned in, in the Steve framework. So we then face here a problem of identification, because there is a, potentially a set of characteristics that might be driving the selection of uh, which color, college to attend, either two year or four year. And this set of characteristics that is driving the selection into the treatment can be influ influencing also the, the educational outcomes. So what we want to do is, here is to separate out as much as possible the effect of attending two year colleges versus the effect of other characteristics, especially observed characteristics. So the intuition here is, uh, well, the, the remedy here is, is called matching, or propensity score matching. And the, the intuition is to find for every unit, for every treated unit defining treatment as attending to your colleges, we, we want to find similar students who were not treated. So those students attending for your colleges. And similar students is defined in different ways, such as especially based on distances between two set of characteristics or vector of characteristics, but there is a lot of uh, methods that do the same, the same thing with a uh, difference across them. So uh, the ideal here is to find uh, for every treated unit, for every student attending two-year colleges, uh, exact, uh, uh, another student attending four-year colleges, but with the same exact uh, vector of characteristics. But this is very, very difficult to do because if we increase the set of characteristics we are controlling for, 
the probability of not finding anyone who matches the, the first students in the treatment group is going to is going to is going to rise to, to one. So, so a, a, a remedy to this problem is to to is what is called propensity score matching. Propensity score matching or propensity scores is and as a number or an index that summarizes the information that it is contained in the vector of uh, observed characteristics. So we can compare students based on this single number instead of based on a set of characteristics. So the basic estimation procedure, this is very general and the literature in this uh, matching is, is very, very extensive. Uh, but this is the basic general framework for estimating a propensity score model. The f in the, the first stage, we're going to estimate the probability of treatment, uh, taking as dependent variable whether or not the students attended, uh, attended two-year colleges. So in, in this case, it's going to be one, and attending four-year colleges is going to be zero. So we, we, we estimate a logit or a probability model in order to estimate the uh, predicted probabilities of, of, of attendance. This is called a propensity score. So everyone has one predicted probability of attendance to your colleges in the sample. So the second step is, is going to be the, the construction of a, of a counterfactual group. So we are going to use this propensity score in order to, to match every student in the treatment group to, to one student in the, in the non treatment group but with a similar propensity score or very similar. Or there's uh, some method that uh, could be could be different uh, based on, on certain features. Finally, uh, we, we want to test for uh, differences across uh, these two groups in, in terms of observables. I want to point, point out that this is the, the most uh, basic method in terms of causal inference because even though it accounts for variation in in obs in, in observer uh, in observer variables, it as well as all, as the na naive model does, uh, it doesn't control for an unobserved, uh, unobserved variable. So it has its, its limitation, but it, it's all, uh, but also reduces the bias when encountering the OLS the, uh, naive model. So the goal of matching is the balance in the treatment and control groups, and based on observed characteristics. So one point here uh, is. If we can do the, if, if both methods, the OLS or the naive, naive uh, regression model and the matching model both control for observed characteristics, what's the difference between them? So this is, and there's a several features that make, that make uh, the, the matching procedure uh, uh, to have advantages over, over the OLS. For instance, the first and most important is matching weights the observation differently than does OLS in calculating the spectral contrafactor for each treated, treated observation. In OLS, all the untreated units play a role in determining the spectral contrafactor for any given treated unit. In matching, only untreated units similar to each treated unit have positive weight in determining the spectral contrafactor. And also matching does not make uh, the linear assumption, uh, the linear functional form assumption that it is done in OLS. And finally, matching helps identify problems of lack of support when there is no matches for, for everyone. Uh, going back to, this, to the example, uh, the dependent variables that were used in this paper was the second and third year college retention rate and the completion of a bachelor's degree. And the variable of interest is whether or not attending to uh, to a community colleges will compare with uh, four year colleges, controlling for a set of uh, observed covariates. The data that they use is, the is, com is coming from the National Education or Longitudinal Study of 1988. And this is an example of, a, of the results obtained. And you can see the total line represents the distribution of the standardized test scores uh, in high school uh, of the untreated units without matching. And the, the two distributions uh, signed uh, by the red and blue arrows are the match, the, the treated units, students attended to two-year colleges, and the match it's four years, uh, students attended four-year institutions. So as you can see, these distributions are, are very similar. They're not exactly the same, but they are similar. So the goal here is to, to, to balance the groups in, a, in such a way that we can see this in every single observed variable that, that we can include in the model. 
And the next uh, table shows also, uh, is an example also uh, of the matching methods uh, conducted in only males. And as you can see, there are four uh, estimated matching models against one OLS match, uh, regression model. So in every single case, the, the, the estimated effect of, the, of, the, of attending to your colleges is, is, is bigger than any of the, of the matching methods. So summarizing in this sample, starting at uh, community colleges, lowers attainment compared with uh, students at, uh, starting at four-year colleges. Uh, in particular, lower retention probabilities after the second and third years, and lowers also the probability of bachelor's completion. Uh, basically, the, uh, one of the main points of this paper is that OLS overestimated the treatment effects, so uh, then matching does a better job to reducing the bias. If not completely eliminating, the matching reduces the bias in this case. Uh, thank you so much. All right, so I'm Rob Bilby, um, third year student in the center also, and I'm gonna discuss with you guys a uh, modeling technique called instrumental variables. And so a little bit of background on instrumental variable models. Um, the general places where we apply these models is when we can't use randomized controlled trials, which are oh, hopefully optimal in most cases. Um, but we also have problems with the observed data. So like Steve was discussing, we generally have selection issues with students choosing to uh, go to take certain um, treatments. And so here we consider omitted variables. Um, there might be motivators for students selecting into some sort of treatment that we can't measure. Additionally, um, IV models allow us to deal with what we call reverse causation, where we have a treatment variable that might actually be driven by our dependent variables of interest. And so there's arrows going in both directions and OLS can't deal well with those models. And so our application here, um, we're looking at high school level course taking and how uh, the courses that students take impact their educational outcomes, both uh, in secondary institutions and uh, post-secondarily. And so a little bit of background on the research that exists on this topic. Um, what we've seen first is policy drift that as we've entered uh, the 21st century, a number of uh, high schools have begun to require their students to take more and more courses in math, science, and English. Um, and it's based on a, an abundance of correlational research that shows that students who take more classes do better um, in post-secondary institutions. And so here's a little demonstration of, or a little bit of a visual of how that's been working. Here on the top line, we see that schools that require one or two years of mathematics has been decreasing over time. However, schools that require three years of mathematics is going up, and schools that require four years of mathematics is going up. Similarly, we see that science requirements are going in the same direction. One and two years of science is going significantly down, where we see three years of science requirements going up, and a little bump in four years of science requirements. And so this is important to show because it, the research that has been done is having a significant policy impact in the nation. And we want to make sure that the, that research is actually showing what's really happening to these students. And so our empirical question here is what's the causal effect of high school course taking on high school graduation, college access, college completion, and other outcomes of, in higher education? And to confront this question, we use three uh, nationally representative longitudinal data sets um, spanning the beginning of late 1980s to the beginning of 2000s. And these all track students over time, so we're able to observe all of their course taking and then how, what happens to those students as they go through their educational career and into the workplace. And so what's our infer inferential problem here? Again, we're talking about self-selection. Students pick the courses that they take in high school. And the issue that we're dealing with is that motivators for choosing courses might also be related to the outcomes that we're interested in. So highly educationally motivated students are going to tend to take higher courses, you know, take your AP Calc class, but those students are also more likely to graduate high school and apply to college, attend college, et cetera. And so we're gonna apply a new st a statistical technique to control for that. And so here's the logic of an instrumental variable technique. When we look at treatment, 
in this case high school level course taking, the variation in that variable consists of two, two components that we're interested in. First is selection, how students are choosing to take their classes, and that's endogenous, which means that it's determined within the equation. Second is exogenous factors. So there's other things that are driving students to take these courses. And if we can get a measure of that, then we can use that variation to model the impacts. And so here's the hard part, picking an IV. Um, this is where IV models become a very difficult um, part of our research strategy. So we want to seek out variables that are strongly, strongly related to our independent variable. So what's strongly related to high school level course taking, but are unrelated to the eventual outcome variables? So what is associated with course taking, but has nothing to do with the fact that you graduated high school or applied to college, et cetera? And the goal of this model is to then use those instruments to remove the endogenous variation from our predictor variables and allow us to make some causal claims about the relationships of course taking and post-secondary outcomes. And so the way we apply this is using a, a technique called two-stage least squares regression, or a number of derivatives of that that Brian's responsible for. Um, so in the first stage, we use our instruments and a number of, of other covariates to generate predicted values of high school course taking. And so we can use a number of variables, generate predictions, then we use in the second stage the predicted values, not the actual values, which then have the removed um, endogenous variation to run a causal regression and actually be able to make some claims about what's going on with students' high school course taking and their educational outcomes. And so our project here, which I feel like I should have talked about already a little bit more, is looking at the effect of high school course taking in math and science and seeing how that impacts aspirations towards higher ed, application to a college, enrollment in college, college performance, and a number of other variables that relate to performance. And we've decided, we've picked a couple of instrumental variables to test here. First is high school level, um, maximum course offerings. So we have data from each of the high schools on what's the highest course that they offer in each of the subjects that we're interested in. So does a school offer only pre-calculus or do they offer AP calculus? This provides us an upper bound on the number of courses that a student could have taken within each subject and allows us to generate fairly good predictions. Another instrument that we're using is local labor market conditions. And so this you can imagine is even more removed from impacting post-secondary outcomes. And the way we use this is if there's a strong labor market in a student's community, you would expect that that student would have a greater interest in becoming a part of the labor market instead of investing more of their energies in taking an additional course in high school. Because if they're gonna be able to make $20 an hour coming out of high school, why are they gonna need to consider going to college? And so these models are running currently, and we have no results to show you. <laughs> but it gives you a good example of what's going on. And in the next presentation, you'll see a nice example of an instrumental variable that's been shown in existing research to not be related to the outcome variables, but does have a strong relationship to the uh, treatment variable of interest. And so thank you. Yeah? Could another instrumental variable have been parents' educational attainment? Sure, and we use that as a control all the time. What you tend to see though is that that variable has a relatively strong relationship to all of the outcome variables that we want to do. And so we're trying to remove that por portion of the variation. So using community level variables or high school level variables has a little bit more distance. Okay. Hi, I'm Allison Flaster, and with jong Yoon Kim, we're going to discuss the use of regression discontinuity in education research. Too quiet back there? Yeah. I can use a mic. Can you hear me? No? Yeah? All right. So regression discontinuity, or RD, is used in situations where subjects are assigned to either a treatment or a control group based on a pre-specified cut score. So for instance, you can consider the situation where incoming college students are placed into math coursework based on their score on a standardized test. And perhaps students who um, score below a certain threshold are placed into a remedial course, and then that remedial course would be the treatment that could then be studied. So in that situation, we assume that students are very similar, close to that cut score used to determine remediation. And um, so since they're close to that, that cut score we can use, that is used to determine whether they receive the treatment or not, 
We can then calculate the average dif difference in the outcome between the treated and untreated groups using data only for students that are around that cut score. So to illustrate the use of regression discontinuity, we are going to present a research project that was conducted by Stephen Bryan and some of our colleagues. And that project looked at how the Gates Millennium Scholars Program was related to college students' time use and activities. So essentially, it's a study of how a, um, the effect of a scholarship program on student success outcomes. So to provide a little background information on the treatment, um, the Gates Millennium Scholars Program is administered by the Gates Foundation. It's very generous. It's a nationwide scholarship. Its goal is to improve uh, college access for high achieving, low income students of color. And it provides a generous scholarship that fully covers their unmet financial need. In order to participate in the program, students must meet certain criteria. They must be Pell eligible. They must have a 3.3 high school GPA or greater. And most significantly, they must score above a particular threshold on a non-cognitive test. And that's what allows us to use regression discontinuity. So, I'm sorry? What test is it? The non-cognitive test. Probably Stephen Bryan can discuss it a little better than I can. It's one that was developed well, Bill Sedlicek, a guy named Bill Sedlicek uh, has a, a set of S, has questions. They were basically these folks were asked a set of essay questions, and the essay questions are then scored by raters, and they're same uh, race raters. So if a black kid wrote, then a, a, a African American person would rate it, and they're they're all independently assessed, and then there would be a distribution on each one of these uh, tests. So it was made for this? Yes. Yeah. Well, no, it, it was applied to this. It was I around see. before this program. Okay. So in estimating the effects of the Gates Millennium Scholars Program, uh, the authors expect that students will respond to the relaxed credit constraints engendered by the scholarship by reallocating the time they devote to various activities. So um, you would expect that students would devote um, less time to, re to working for pay, but may increase their time spent on extracurricular activities such as community service. And in this particular presentation, we're going to focus on the, um, those two outcomes, the hours worked and the hours spent in community service, although the study looked at a whole host of outcomes, such as how Gates Millennium Scholars impacted students' probability of graduating from college or increasing their aspirations to attend graduate school. Um, it's important to note, however, that there is an inherent causal problem in estimating the effects of the Gates Millennium Scholars Program and that observed and unobserved student characteristics may influence the outcomes. For instance, it's, it's quite plausible that students who are more um, civically oriented may be more likely to apply for and receive the scholarship, and those are the students who would be more likely to engage in community service. So in order to kind of parse out the effects of the program itself from these inherent unobserved student characteristics, it's important that a quasi-experimental method is applied in this situation. Uh, we used regression discontinuity. So Zhang Yun is going to discuss the details of how that was applied in greater detail. Hi, uh, my name is Chung Kim. I'm a third year PhD student in higher education at School of Education. Um, thanks for listening to um, nicely set up the context. So I'm going to go through how we can use and uh, when we can use RD design before we go through how we apply these methods to studying GMS. So we can use RD when we have a uh, forcing variable, which is a scoring rule to assign the intervention to study units. And we use cut of value for assignment. So for example, we give fellowship to students based on their math score. And students can get their fellowship if they score 80 um, out of 100. So if a student scored more than um, above 80, they will get the scholarship, which means that they are in the treatment group. But if they didn't meet the 80% uh, percent of 100, they will be at the below of the cutoff, which means they are at control group and not receiving the fellowship. So uh, in that case, if a student just missed the scholarship because they scored 79, and think about the case uh, when students got the scholarship because they just scored 80 or 81, then probably the distribution of that scholarship uh, or fellowship will be approximately random. So which means that the characteristics of these students are very similar. So, um, so it's basically mimicking the randomized trier, which means well-designed RD can be as good as the randomized control triers. 
Um, so after we assign the people to treatment group and control group, we can uh, we estimate the outcomes uh, for each group. And by getting the mean differences between these two groups and their outcomes, we can estimate the, the effect of the scholarship or the program at the cut point. Um, so how did we apply the RD for studying GMS? Um, the selection mechanism of GMS, which is the non-cognitive scores, allowed to um, apply this method. So our first thing variable becomes the non-cognitive scores, and we use cutoff value for assigning students. So basically, the cutoff score was varied by race and eth race, ethnicity, and cohort because there were there were thousands of students that was uh, that who can get the scholarship, but they wanted to have nice distri distribution of uh, each racial subgroups. So. Um, for each race groups, they had different cutoffs. So basically, if students scored below the cutoff, they were in the control group, which are the non-recipients. And if they made uh, above the cut cutoff score, they received the GMS. So if it's the case, we call that design uh, as sharp RD, which means the assignment is solely depend uh, determined by a single index, in this case, non-cognitive test score. But that was not the case for GMS. What happened was uh, students who received a, a higher score than the cut point still did not get the GMS because there were other eligibility criteria, such as pay eligibility or minimum high school GPA requirement. So in that case, what we have to do is applying fuzzy RD, which is basically goes back to instrumental variable approach. So we use cut, uh, cut score of non-cognitive score to predict the probability of receiving GMS and use that fitted value from stage one to estimate the effects on outcomes. So here are some examples of our results. First is um, the participation in community service. So as you see here in the graph, you can see that um, there is a jump here, like at the cut point, which means that um, for students who receive GMS, they have higher participation in community service. So for example, for Latino students in core three, as you see in the graph, GMS increased their participation in community service by 14%. And here's the other example of our um, outcome, which is work hours. So as you see here, all directions are negative, which means that um, GMS decreased the students' work hours about four to five uh, per week in their freshman and junior year and across all the racial subgroups. Thank you. Okay, so I'll uh, just wrap it up here. Um, basically, what we see here is that, uh, and we want to stress is that randomized controlled trials are really the gold standard, but many times we can't employ them. And, uh, and so in, in education, as many of you know, who work in, uh, you know, in evaluating courses or many other programs, is oftentimes we're uh, we use uh, inst institutional data and other observational data that's provided to us. And, uh, you know, randomized trials weren't thought about when people put uh, institutional data together, right? They put it together for lots of other reasons, not for us, to, usually not thinking about it in terms of us on what to study. So many times we're stuck with observational data, and that's great. There's a ways to try to deal with this. Ultimately, the goal here is to try to make strong causal I put causal in quotes because when we're into quasi-experimental stuff, we're really technically not in causal, uh, uh, making causal inferences, but you can think of a continuum of things uh, along the causal kind of, uh, along a causal continuum there is anecdote at one side. How do you know that program works? Because so-and-so told me it does. Well, all right, that's fine, and they very well may be right. Many times in the stuff that I've done over the years in my institutional research work, I find out that they do in fact know whether their programs work. But on the other end, we have randomized controlled trials. What these methods do is they push us more towards the randomized controlled trial and making strong inferences about program effects. And that helps us understand the mechanisms that are operating then and how to either change programs, make them more effective, uh, put new programs in place, 
you know, uh, scale up programs. Um, and I, I think uh, one of the things I'd like to end with is that uh, just like we're trying to do in the general higher education literature now is I think that if we're going to evaluate the programs, policies, procedures, and things that are going on here within our own institution, we ought to be using the most rigorous methods to do that. And anything less than that just doesn't seem acceptable to me. We have the talent here to do that. Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of smart students who can assist in that kind of thing. And we, Brian and I, and my colleagues remain available to do that. We'll put this up on the, um, on the website. And one of the things that I think will benefit you greatly is we have about four or five pages here of references to all these techniques. Some of these are journal articles, some of these are books, and I think those would really help you if you're interested in learning more about these, because we could just scratch the surface here. Thank you for inviting us, and I'm very proud of our students, and thank them for their hard work on this. So, take some. All right, uh, we, we are happy to have some time for questions. Uh, so, questions from anyone? Yes. And I'm curious, you made it, um, some comparisons like kind of in the midst of the analysis. Did you actually run the analysis all the way through to see what the difference in using like OLS versus this, what the actual difference is? Well, I think uh, I can pass over for <laughs> if, if we made the analysis for for measuring the differences between these the, the estimated effects between the OLS and the matching methods. Yeah. If we did that in the in the paper. Yeah, in the paper, it's in fact, if you saw that table, there were uh, four other there were four different kinds of matching methods that were used because um, one of the issues here is what's a match, and so you get this in this score, this propensity score, and so let's say I'm a treated person and my propensity to, to into treatment is 0.73. Uh, is, do I have to find somebody in the four-year institution who has a 0.73 or is 0.72 close enough or is 0.74 close enough? And so there's lots of different ways to try to construct that comparison group and that's what those other techniques are doing. And if you look at that table, the OLS is kind of the baseline. That would be what we think is the naive model. And then what you see is what Alfredo said was that in every case, the OLS is overestimating the effect of being in a two-year institution on four-year outcomes. Want to talk about that? The basically bandwidth, right? Yeah. Uh, well, in regression discontinuity, you're right. There, it's what we call local average treatment effect. It's really the uh, estimate of the treatment for people who are near the cut point, and so uh, that's one of the problems. Is uh, this sort of external validity to other groups that are further away from the treatment. Now in the RD uh, that we did for Gates, uh, the way that they determined the cutoff scores actually was by, they had a certain number of scholarships to give out for each of these uh, different ethnic groups. Those were fixed up front and then the cutoff was determined simply by the number of applications for each racial group. Uh, so you did get some variation across cut scores uh, over time and then across racial groups uh, that buys you a little bit of more generalizability but not much. Um, but that's one of the limitations of that sort of study is that you can only make statements about people that are uh, causal statements about people that are near the cut point. Now there are other, uh, for example, scholarship programs, one that we're investigating called the Bright Futures Program in Florida, which uh, has uh, uh, a number of cut points on how much scholarships 
people get, for example, they might uh, ratchet up the, the percent of tuition that they cover depending on, for example, their SAT score. So they might go from zero up to 50 to 75 and then up to 100. So you, you have several cutoff points that might help you be a little more uh, in terms of uh, generalizing. Uh, but again, you still are really only making a causal statement around the cut points. And that's, again, the drawback of that type of technique. Bandwidth of that depends on how strongly the cutting variable is related to the outcome. So if you had one that was random, unrelated completely, you would just be doing a randomized control. Right, yeah. The, the thing about the randomized control is uh, it would essentially, yeah, you could use all the data. Yeah. Usually you choose the optimal bandwidth based on uh, essentially two things how much you want to trade off bias with how much you want to trade off variance. The, the narrower the bandwidth, the, the larger the variance, but the lower the bias. And so it's really a function of how much data you have near the cut. Yeah. So one of the things we did there was we would we would do the estimate of like one one point on either side. Then we'd do it two points on either side. Then we'd do it three points and we'd work out the bandwidth. And there's a way to test for whether or not in the individuals, where the randomization breaks down. So if you get out 10 points, all of a sudden you see characteristics that indicate uh, differences in the, in the treatment and control group where they indicate they're no longer randomly so, uh, distributed. Others? Barry. You want to take it? Yeah, sure. I'll All right. No. So, one of the nice things about uh, this kind of model is, um, especially in our case, because we found more than one, what we can do is called an over identification test. So, uh, instrumental variable model is considered to be identified when you have one instrument for each independent variable of interest. And so, if you can find more than one, what you can do is actually conduct a statistical test to see if the are actually related to the variable of interest and then how it's related to your dependent variable. So we simplified this a little bit. The issue um, with endogeneity is actually if you look at the first stage and second stage regressions, the correlations are between the errors in both equations and that's what's causing your problem. And so when you're over identified, we have the ability to test whether or not those errors are still correlated to the same degree. And that gives us, us an idea of how good our instrument is. Let me give you an example, Barry, from the, from the, from the Gates um, thing. Brian and I went to do a presentation to a bunch of student financial aid folks one year. And there were people in the audience who knew about the Sedlicex um, uh, um, instruments. And they, they, right away they said, whoa, wait a minute, the problem here is those things aren't related at all to the kind of outcomes you're studying. And we said, that's exactly what we want. Right. You want to have the instrument be highly related to selection, into treatment, but unrelated to your outcomes. And what's happening here, and we could demonstrate this in the, in the Gates data, is that the first, that first equation you run is the probability of being in a Gates, a Gates or not, and you can test uh, whether, you know, the fit of that model and how highly related the, in this case, the test is to selection and it's determining almost exclusively selection into treatment, except for the cases where there's a few cases where they weren't Pell eligible or whatever. So it's really highly related to selection, almost deterministically, but unrelated to the outcomes in the second equation. That's the definition of an effective instrument. Yeah. Uh -huh. Level of math or like whatever right. at the 
the school. Um, so how do you know though that like those variables themselves, like what what math was offered and what the labor market is like, uh, is in itself controlled by yeah a, an underlying variable which also would affect uh, how well the student is able to perform in college. For example, uh, like the um, income of the people who live in that area probably has an effect on how much money their school has and what programs they're able to offer. And it also has an effect on the violent crime rate in the area, which would make it harder for students to perform well in school. You see what I'm saying? Like, right. Uh, yeah. Maybe like an even more underlying variable that both affects what the values of the instrumental variable are and what their propensity to perform well in college would be. And I think you're always going to be able to tell that story. I mean, I could, you know, say my instrument is like the number of inches of rain in an area, which people have used on, you know, some sort of social outcome. And so you just have to be willing. I mean, we'd have to be willing to make some assumptions. That's what statistics is essentially based on. And so instrument selection is very difficult and limited by data. And so there are people here who would, you know, at this very institution who would say, you know, you're never going to find a good instrument. And that may be the case, but this is going to get us closer than just using a basic OLS regression will. And so we have to settle on the assumptions. Yeah, well, the one thing that improves it, at least in this case, is um, like for college, uh, yeah, the, what we use is, we also, this is longitudinal data, so we have time variation in a lot of these uh, variables like, say, uh, local labor market conditions. And so what we're using is local labor market conditions at the time you're in 10th grade, but we're also controlling for the local labor market conditions when you're in college. So it's the differential, it's a change over time within a certain region that that differential in time that's the identification. Uh, we, you we're not using some sort of fixed time uh, constant type variable. So it's more of the variation over time within a narrow region. Like in this case, we're using sort of county uh, uh, labor market conditions uh, at that time. In addition, what we use is we have data, exact data f uh, on labor market conditions by age group. So we can control for labor market conditions for in, uh, the parents which would be people, uh, say, uh, 35 to 55, and we, but we know the labor market conditions of the individuals who are 14 to 19, so we have data on that. So we can control for the labor market conditions, you know, for the group that may affect income, that may affect, you know, whether or not you can afford to go to college, and it's labor market conditions of the youth that may affect whether they want to spend more time in school or more time working. And if they spend more time in school, the argument is that they're going to take different set of courses, uh, potentially. I mean, what we need to do is see what the relationship in the first stage is between how those conditions relate to uh, whether or not they take different courses. So we're using very fine level variation, controlling for many other things, both the time variation across these individuals in the unemployment rates or labor market conditions related to them, plus controlling for aggregate labor market conditions for sort of, uh, uh, you know, prime age uh, workers in order to adjust for the effects that, yeah, you know, you, your household income may be different if, if your parents, you know, are, are unemployed versus employed. So one of the things is your point is really about kind of a general equilibrium problem in that these things are hugely complicated structures. And if you think you're going to estimate the whole structural relationship, it just doesn't happen. So what we do is we take pieces of it and we do pieces of it at a time, which is called reduced form. And so, you know, the point that Rob made about making some assumptions, when you do reduce form stuff and you're not trying to build some huge structural model, there's trade-offs. And, uh, you know, structural, huge structural models are hard to do. And, um, you know, can you, you know, imagine trying to estimate, you know, the effects of socioeconomic status over time and things like this. It's just very, very complex. So, uh, anyway, anything else? Yes? question about the um, course selection in high school, and I think you said it was part, was part of it measured by how many courses people are using or not? 
Sure. Yeah. So we have a few different measures um, of what courses we have within math and science specifically. We have um, there's pipeline measures of the courses that you've taken, and then we count the number of AP courses that you took in addition. And then we also just have a variable that's sort of closer to continuous, the number of Carnegie units that you've taken in either subject. So my question is, I work at lots of high schools where there's AP courses offered, but nobody, nobody is passing an AP test the level of three or above. So. Great. I see these national studies that say it's better to push kids into these advanced content knowledge classes. But is anybody studying the number of classes you took and what that means in a high school and actual degree received at a university? I mean, we, we make this argument that take more math and science classes in high school, we'll have more people studying engineering and math and science in college who get degrees. But I'm not positive that that actually is true. It opens up some more opportunities in that first year, but the attrition rates nationally in engineering and other are still at these astronomical levels. And so I'm just wondering. So I think that's a great dependent variable for us to add that we don't have at this point is what what you're actually majored in and degreed in, right? That's, that's your question. Because what our outcomes. Does, it affect, does high school course selection actually affect the number of de the actual number of degrees awarded in math, science, and engineering at college among underrepresented groups or groups that traditionally were not getting these degrees. Mm. So that's a little harder to test. I have a, I have a, so there's a student of ours who now took a job uh, as a, he's an assistant professor now at Arizona. One way to tease this out would be he built a data set of 40 years of iPads data, which has all the program level counts. Right? So you could look at, you could imagine getting individual, and in iPads there's individual unit record data too. So you could do something like we're talking about here and look at enrollment counts and programs uh, and, and using the methods we're talking about, control for that selection problem in the courses. Uh, I'll raise it with Ozan. He's got every incentive to do these kinds of things for the next six or seven years, so <laughs> anyway. I think there was one more question. Oh, Brian. Okay, great. Well, I think we'll stop there then. If you have any more questions, feel free to come up. Thank all of the speakers for today.